never defeat the Lotus Clan with our River Dragon. Fool! It is not you who shall be defeated. Wait, what? What the? Why are you doing this? Victory requires honor. Honor requires sacrifice. And sacrifice requires... How are you going to win by... Wait, what? Wait, stop! Stop! Somebody stop them! What the? Did they just kidnap our dragon? Help! Oh yeah? Well, we won the battle! We won... Hold this L! We'll rounding out the Eric M. Lang area control shelf side reviews. We got Ark, we got Blood Rage, and now finally, Rising Sun. But we want to clarify that this will be a review of the base game and not all the extra stuff from Kickstarter exclusives and expansions. What is this? No more keeping you all waiting. Let's explain the game. Rising Sun is an area control game for three to five players. It takes about two hours to play. Everyone picks one of five different factions, each with unique abilities, and you win by getting the most victory points when the game ends. A game ends after three rounds, aka seasons. Spring, summer, then lastly, autumn. Each season uses this timeline up here, and going from left to right, you'll resolve everything one at a time. First is the tea ceremony phase, where everyone negotiates to form alliances, which aren't freeform like in most other games. So you're stuck with these alliances for the rest of the season unless some effect breaks it up. This phase is done once everyone's agreed it's done, and you don't actually have to be in an alliance if you don't want to. Next, there's going to be seven player turns. On a player's turn, all they do is draw four tiles from this stack of action tiles, then choose one to play, resolve its effect, and put the three leftovers back on top before passing the stack. Boom, next player turn, do that until it's been seven turns. There's five different actions. Recruit spawns dudes from your strongholds. Marshall moves dudes around and lets you build strongholds. Train lets you buy a permanent ability card. Harvest lets you gain resources from areas you control. And Betray lets you replace up to two other figures with your own, plus breaks your alliance. But the big brain weird part about playing actions is that everyone gets to do the action that you played, starting with the player to your left and going clockwise until you do the action last, meaning you react to what everyone else does. In addition, both you and your ally will receive bonus effects that make the action stronger. There's a few exceptions to all this though, like the train action you start first instead so you can get the first dibs on powerful cards. And then Betray is totally bonkers. Only the turn player does this action and there's no bonus because, you know, it breaks alliances which makes it extremely spicy if timed properly. Oh yeah, also after the third, fifth, and seventh turns, certain bonus effects will activate that we'll explain later. Anyways, after seven turns, the season enters the war phase where you resolve resolve fights in different provinces in this order, which is randomized every season. A battle for a province happens when there's multiple factions with minis there, except if there's only two allied factions. Everyone in the battle secretly bids on four different fighting bonuses. When everyone's done allocating their coins, they reveal, then resolve, going from left to right. First is seppuku. Whoever wins it may kill all their figures for one point and one honor each. By the way, honor tracks who wins ties over everything in the game. If you're above someone in honor, you'll win that tie. Winning take hostage lets you take someone figure and steal a point from them, plus return it next season for money. Winning higher Ronin allows you to strengthen your force by one for each of your Ronin tokens, which is a resource you can get from actions beforehand. Also, Ronins are reusable for the entire war phase. They're never spent. After resolving those three effects, now you look at the total force in the province and see who won. Winning a battle in a province has you killing everyone else's figures there except allies and lets you take that province tile, which is worth points depending on season. One for spring, two for summer, three for autumn. However, at the end of the game, you get bonus points based on how many different provinces you won throughout the game. Look at that, if you have seven or eight different colored province tiles, boom, 30 more points, holy shit. But wait, wasn't there a fourth fighting bonus to bid on? Well, after resolving the battle, whoever wins Imperial Poets, regardless of if they won or lost the battle, gets a point for every figure that died in it. So yeah, you totally can get a ton of points for losing in the coolest way via Mass Epiku and Imperial Poets. And finally, the winner gives all the money spent on the battle to all the losers as evenly as possible, which 
is why the order the different provinces fight matters a lot. Because a player who lost their early fights goes into later ones with a hell of a lot more money. Who knows if they spend it on winning the final battle or securing seppuku to ensure highest honor for next season. After resolving all fights in a war phase, you do a whole bunch of upkeep and move on to the next season. So there'll be different ability cards to buy, new alliances forged, different random war province tokens, and super interestingly, you lose all your money and ronins, then reset to your seasonal income. So now that you know how to play, let's move on to the next part, liking and subscribing this video, <laughs> and then uh, pros components. First, a disclaimer. We don't own this copy. This is borrowed from a friend who has the Kickstarter exclusive Daimyo box, which has deluxe components plus extra content like a new faction and more monsters to throw in. Plus, he 3D printed custom inserts. Man, all of this is definitely sick as fuck. So uh, I guess if you're willing to drop a few hundred dollars for this, then you're in good hands because the Strongholds, Alliance tokens, action tiles, war order flags, and Ronins are all really cool to play around with because in base game, these are all just cardboard punch outs. Unfortunately, that means we can't really comment on the normal not deluxe components or the original insert because I have no idea where my buddy has them. Maybe you threw most of them out or something. I don't know. Anyways, on to the component pros we can definitely talk about. Starting with just how well all the color coding is done in Rising Sun. It's absolutely idiot proof and there's no way you're getting anything mixed up ever. All the minis are their proper faction colors, everyone starts the game on the spot that is their color, and everyone has these mini base rings so they can mark which monsters are theirs. Also, this game has a metric of fuck ton of minis, 58 specifically, with quite a bit of diversity too among the factions. And there's even white slash black bases for each faction's Shintos and Daimyos, so you can easily tell which minis got them special abilities, none of that. Wait, is, is that your Daimyo? He, he's got two swords, right? Basically, if you're scared this is another board game that has a ton of minis that are barely used, absolutely not the case here. And big props were everything being so distinctive and clear during gameplay, despite the flood of miniatures everywhere. But the color coding doesn't just stop there, because we got the seasonal ability cards with Green Spring, Yellow Summer, and Red Autumn. Love the traffic light colors. But more importantly, the abilities themselves are also divided into five colors. Red for war phase effects, blue for passives, green for conditional effects, brown for monsters, and light blue for end game bonus points. All the art and graphic design everywhere makes all the pieces just so visually distinct from one another. It's this beautiful mix of color coding plus popping artwork that comes together to make all the information presented so perfectly clear, both when compared against pieces of the same type, like your action tiles among each other, as well as when standing out against all the other components too. Not to mention all the different types of components have different shapes and sizes, all of which look great against the board itself, which conveys everything it needs to in a very concise and visually appealing manner. Like take these war number tokens and war province tiles as examples. We have never been confused by which areas are fighting and in what order. Look at the war province tokens. They got the color, name, and where it is on the map. Plus these tiles being something that's shuffled, laid out, and then given to players who win the area for scoring makes them overall super functional components in how they're utilized. Also, a ton of other games probably would have just left it at having the war province tiles, but Rising Sun decides to also have the war number tokens to really hammer in the fight order for the players. Next clarity thing to praise is how the player aid screens say the faction ability on both sides to help out everyone at the table. Plus, showcase some great art of the three different types of minis from the faction. Inside has everything you need to know about the faction's setup and highlights a very important source of victory points that's great for newbies to know as important. Plus, these screens hide war bonuses when bidding, so all around great component that does all of its jobs well. Also, the war bonus tile being double-sided, one for when everyone's doing actions and the other for the war phase, is a very nice segmentation since you'll never need the other side till you actually get there in the game. And last cool player aid thing to point out is how the season timeline functions not just as a player aid for how a round works, but also as the spot where everyone plays their actions. Very clean design and how no one has excess stuff like individual player aids lying around. It's all just components that are physically used in some way. Next, for a bunch of random tidbit component pros, Alliance tokens being half of a yin yang circle that can actually connect with another one is a super satisfying cute little thing to play around with. Clan markers, which are used for both honor and points, have these little holes and nubs on their edges that let them slot into each other if you stack them, so they'll never shift around. Why don't more games do this for stacking tokens? Rising Sun doesn't even really need it because it's impossible to be tied in honor, and points usually go high enough that you rarely need to stack markers for ties anyways, but goddamn is it nice to have. And after seeing this, for other games that frequently have stuff stacked, we now think it's a necessity. Lastly, the non-cardboard plastic coins are a great way to have coins 
coins make satisfying clink noises despite not being metal. Overall, when it comes to components, Rising Sun is super high quality. Like this is exemplary stuff right here. And something we'd point to as why someone would want to shell out more money, not just for deluxe components, but also just for high quality base pieces as well. Because everything here is just oozing with thematic aesthetics alongside highly functional and clever utilization in its design. It just feels like a lot of other games would have had the action tiles or action player aid be cards instead. So it's nice that they're thick cardboard here. But yeah, stuff like the design that went into the physical aspect of Rising Sun can be pretty easy to forget about while you're playing because so many things are just working super smoothly. And we want to point it all out because it's one of those things you get really annoyed about if it's done poorly, but then forget about if done well, because instead you're just focusing on the gameplay itself while playing. Speaking of gameplay bros. First of all, the honor system is a super unique system that's really easy to understand and really cool to play around with as an extremely important concept of Rising Sun. Seriously, do not underestimate the benefit of beating other players in ties because it will come up very frequently in all aspects of the game. Like, ho ho, we all have one dude in these three spots. Yet when I play Harvest, I get all the resources because I'm highest honor and actually win all of these ties. Get wrecked, nerds. By the way, all figures in the game are only worth one force. Yes, even the monsters, unless they say otherwise. So yeah, of course, ties over board presence happens all the time because it's really hard to have overwhelmingly more force than someone else. And when war breaks out, since there's four different bonuses to secretly bid on, bruh, ties will happen a lot here. Unless someone goes hard on only one category. But remember that winning the fight isn't necessarily winning the game. If someone pulls off a really cheap seppuku plus Imperial Poets combo for a ton of points. So it's really common to be splitting up the secret bid to better control the fight in an attempt to block off important bonuses. But just as important as winning war ties is winning ties for those bonus effects that happen after the third, fifth, and seventh actions for a season that we mentioned earlier. These are called Kami tiles, and whenever you spawn in a mini with a white base called a Shinto, you can choose to instead spawn it at one of these four tiles, which are randomly chosen for your game, each having its own unique benefit. Those Shinto minis stay there the whole season, so if you secure a Kami or two early on in a season by having the most Shintos on those Kami, you will get so many activations where you get free shit like more money, more dudes, more Ronin, you name it. Contesting the Kami benefits is a really clever mechanic since it comes at the cost of having less board presence because you're diverting your normal spawns off board, but with a potentially huge upside. However, there's not just the risk of less dudes on the map, but also the possibility that your Shinto ended up being completely wasted. You see, Shintos on Kami can normally never be interacted with for the season, so like you can't move them and others can't use Betray on them. So if someone gets higher honor than you or spawns more Shinto, yours aren't doing anything when they could have been fighting over a province. But then maybe you want people to waste your Shinto. You can totally force someone else's hand if you're highest honor and just go wide by placing one Shinto on three different Kami. Oh, and by the way, everyone has three Shinto minis, so in order for someone to contest any of your Kami, they have to put two Shinto there since you win all ties, which may be really unideal to do if they really need those two dudes on the map, but they kind of have to because if you get nine Kami activations in a season, you're probably winning that game. Kami and Shinto are a very thoughtful and very cutthroat mechanic to play around. Absolutely love the risk reward that goes into it. And with seven different Kami, there's plenty of different combinations for replayability, especially because they all resolve from left to right during the Kami activation phase, which means yes, even their order matters. If the honor go up Kami is on the leftmost, that can really fuck with the rest of the Kami. Or what if someone wins the Kami that lets them buy an ability card? So they buy a monster, by the way, buying a monster spawns it immediately, and that monster does stuff when it's summoned or moved. Then immediately after buying it, they move it twice in a row from the movement Kami. All of that is just thinking through when a recruit action is played and summoning some Shinto, the rest of the actions, plus that whole thing about resolving them with the person to your left going first and going clockwise till you go last, that's all super crunchy to think through. Like you really have to think about it if you're getting the most benefit out of your action because you may be helping someone else at the table too much, especially your ally for the season. There's definitely times when alliance works out way more in one person's favor based on how the alliance bonuses for actions end up panning out. Of course, you could also be a sick fuck and promise that you'll play something for your ally only to end up playing Betray to replace two figures on the map with your own. However, what's really thoughtful design is that Betray while in an alliance will not only break it, but also make you lose an honor while doing Betray when not in an alliance has no drawbacks. So you really gotta think through your alliances during the beginning of each season and what you're trying to get out of it before you get into a situation where you realize all your possible actions help others 
too much. And your only reasonable play is to betray and take the honor hit. And just to clarify, betray doesn't have to target the player whose alliance you broke. You just replace one mini from two different players of your choice with a mini of the matching type. So like normal dude for normal dude or monster for monster. This is a really powerful action to threaten if it's on your terms because it gives a sense of map presence everywhere. So everyone has to be careful not to spread too thin in places that they really wanted to be in because they may find their forces replaced during the end of the season. And suddenly they're no longer participating in those regions come wartime. Another super important aspect about actions is how there's 10 tiles total with two copies of each action in the stack. You have to keep this in mind when thinking about how likely it is you'll be able to get another recruit or marshal or whatever it is you need for the season. Rising Sun isn't a game where you freely can just do whatever on your turn. Well, it can be if you want to do random goofy shit without caring about winning. This is a game where you not only have to think about how likely it is that you'll be able to do the actions you want, but also getting the most out of them compared to everyone else. You'll often find yourselves weighing between picking the action that you want to be doing for whatever strategy you're pushing versus the option that contextually just became very good to do solely because it helps yourself a bunch and not really everyone else. It's for this reason that big harvests and betrays stand out as really strong swings in your favor since everyone else gets pretty much nothing out of them. While the train action is usually pretty weak because it always helps everyone, so it's not that worthwhile unless you can really snipe a crucial ability card for yourself. At the same time though, train's self slash ally benefit is really small, so it could be a way to screw over an ally if you're getting huge bonuses from their actions, but then you want to make sure they aren't getting that much back from you. God, the design here is brilliant and how many multifaceted ways you can utilize benefits and drawbacks in order to manipulate them to your advantage because of how everyone is directly involved in some way whenever an action is played, especially allies. And on top of all that, this game has really freeform trading and diplomacy allowed too. And that the only time you're not allowed to trade is during the war phase. This is where the possibilities of Rising Sun get absolutely nutty because all the sneaky bullshit described earlier can also be leveraged into all sorts of deals. Maybe someone begs their ally not to betray and instead play on a marshal, so then some money or ronin are offered as a bribe. Or what if the player to the left of the turn player begs them to play train in order to get an ability card that generates a lot of points, and so they offer most of their money since the strategy isn't contingent on winning a ton of fights. Rising Sun gameplay ends up being greatly diplomatic because not only are all the mechanics really deep if you take the time to meticulously track which actions are left in the stack and who will probably come out on top of any given action played in the current game state, but also when you take all that and mix in freely trade resources and her favors, you get amazing shit shows. You'd be surprised just how many random aspects of the game are ripe for contention and deal making when it's not even war phase. A huge part of that is the harvest mechanic, since it's possible to be greatly rewarded for winning over areas before actually fighting. It's also deceptively hard to set up big harvests because of how martial and recruit affect everyone else, so it's tough to be in the right places at the right time for you to play a harvest. But again, diplomacy, so maybe you can convince your ally to play harvest harvest and they get some of what you gained in return. Or I don't know, they play the harvest and you promise to play a marsh on your turn and then move all your guys out of a province. Look, you can make your deals as free form as you want, okay? Also want to point out that there's no harvest spot on the board that gives a good amount of money and ronin. It's always a bunch of points, bunch of money, bunch of ronin, or one of everything. Making it so that if you want big harvests that actually win you fights, you're going to have to be positioned well and wide enough. This means that Rising Sun always has players incentivized to be posturing and moving about to set up all sorts of plays, and it's great how much this game gets people moving to new areas in ways outside of just battles, which is already more than enough to get these minis moving around to collect different war province tokens. But all of that death and possibility doesn't just stop there, because during war phase, the blind bidding here is extremely nuanced, and battles are so much more than just having more dudes than the other guy. Example, you have one guy, one ronin, and ten money, versus your opponent with three guys, five ronin, and five money. If you have have more honor, you can actually guarantee the win by just bidding five on both hostage and ronin, which the opponent can't contest since they lose ties. This would put the opponent at two guys since you kidnap one versus your one guy plus one ronin. And in a 2v2, you win with your higher honor. And for context, before any battle bidding begins, all players must tell each other how much money and ronins they have, so yes, you will be bidding this precisely. But even though you can guarantee that win, should you? What if you went five and five on hostage ronin, but then your opponent just goes one and one? 
one on seppuku imperial poets. Seppuku triggers first, so they get three points and honor. Plus, you won't get to hostage anyone since they're all dead. And then, they double dip on their deaths with three more points from imperial poets. Then to top it off, you give them all those ten coins you spent since you won, granting your opponent way more fuel for the rest of this war phase. So then, maybe you shouldn't go 5-5 hostage Ronin, but instead, one on everything because you're trying to budget your money throughout the war phase and hope your opponent is doing the same by going 1-1 one, one seppuku poets. But then what if your opponent thinks that you think they won't bother contesting hostage and Ronin, and so they do in fact go 2-2 two and two on hostage Ronin to steal away the victory. So that's a situation where you can talk yourself into a sort of 50-50 even though you can guarantee a win. But what about when the possibilities are so ludicrous that you can't guarantee anything? Something like having one dude, five money, two Ronin, and more honor, while your opponent has two dudes and ten money. The reason this is a toss-up for winning is because since you have more honor, your opponent can't just block off hostage and Ronin with 5-5, five, five, since you could just dump all of your five on one of them and still win. You see, no matter who gets hostage and who gets Ronin, if each player gets one of them, you'd still come out on top because if you win hostage and they win Ronin, it's more like attempting to deny Ronin, you hostage one of their dudes. They don't have any Ronin, and it becomes one dude versus one dude, with you winning the tie. Meanwhile, if you win Ronin and they win hostage, sure, you lose your dude, but then two Ronin versus two dudes means you win that tie. Thus, if your opponent is trying to win this fight, it would make sense to just put six on either hostage or Ronin and hope they end up hitting whichever one you put five on. But what if you catch on to this and just go one one on hostage and Ronin to cheaply sidestep the big six? Or what if your opponent thinks you'll do that and goes two two on hostage Ronin? Or what if your opponent goes one two two one to cover their ass because this is great against you going one one since it beats that, but it's also a fallback option if you dump five on Ronin or Seppuku because then your opponent makes a clean getaway loss via Seppuku and Poets for their two dudes. The possibilities for how combat can develop is insane. There's nothing quite like pulling off a really cheap victory via mind games, or even a really cheap loss, where you actually got more out of it than the winner. Especially if they end up giving you a ton of money for their victory, and you use all of that to go on a rampage for your later fights in the war phase. The fact that the option to budget your bids exists across four different bonuses has you second-guessing everything during the first few fights of a war phase. And it's almost never clear or guaranteed who's actually going to end up winning the battle unless it's the last fight of a war phase where everyone is free to spend all their money. Unless, of course, people are still negotiating, even during war, because I've seen people agree to throw fights or even purposely overspend to funnel money to someone all for future promises, which is absolutely hysterical. Even more so when there's fights involving at least three players, because yes, everyone is bidding against each other at the same time, and things get wacky really quickly when different war bonuses are won by different players. So ultimately, Rising Sun's bidding combat is some of the most thoughtful gameplay you can get out there. And there's so many more aspects to think through in comparison to games like Dune or Scythe that just have you bidding for one thing plus throwing some cards into it, which makes it way less often that you can just brute force victories by having more power beforehand while knowing exactly what your opponent is capable of. And what's super impressive is that Rising Sun still manages to do this while having borderline no hidden information. The mechanics are just that in-depth when accounting everyone's crazy effect cards, where money is flowing, what order areas fight in, how honor might change outcomes, and how many forces plus Ronin are involved. But what's even crazier is that despite going into all the nitty gritty details of combat, that aspect of the game doesn't even need to be your primary source of points. Getting points from harvesting, kami, and ability cards can be just as potent. And if you manipulate the game state so that you're making deals and supporting people so that they're winning their fights at an equal rate, or go, no one's getting that 30 point bonus, or maybe they are, but they don't have any point generating cards, then you can still come out on top without even winning much, if any fights. Granted, this doesn't mean you can just ignore combat mechanics, more that you need to master them in a different way. All right, let's get on to the pros involving Rising Sun's replayability, pacing, and progression. First thing to talk about are the five factions' different abilities and stats like seasonal income come in starting honor. Each of them breaks the rules in one aspect, and they all have varying stats that are balanced around their ability. This may seem really basic since it's just some slight number changes in one ability, but these definitely matter a lot in how they're utilized. Even more so when considering how a ton of numbers in this game end up being pretty close, hence why ties and honor will come up a lot. Which means anything that gives even slight benefits can enable huge wins. The innate faction asymmetry isn't super crazy or anything when compared to some other area control board games, but the differences 
differences here are definitely really impactful. Where crazy asymmetry truly happens comes from these cards. Because uh, by the time it's autumn and everyone has a handful of these, that's when everyone starts to feel extremely different from one another. When setting up the ability cards for the game, there's this core deck of seven cards per season, which will always be used. But then you pick a set of 15 cards like the teapot set or the archway set, each having five cards per season to throw into the mix. There's three different sets of cards, horsemen, teapot, and archway. And while that looks like you'll see everything just by playing only three times, these car sets offer more replayability than you'd think because it takes a few games to understand what's absolutely correct in each set, along with what's good in the core set and how this interacts with the cards that were thrown in. Of course, there's some obvious combos like picking up an Oni that procs off of spawning or moving, which is nuts on the Dragonfly clan who can teleport move. But then there's stuff that's less obvious, like Way of the Merchant, which might seem really situational until you realize that this is busted for Harvest. Didn't note this before, but Harvest has an innate effect where everyone gains one money. It's not just the province benefits. Which means that if you're the poorest with Way of the Merchant and someone harvests, you're getting one money per player, which is nuts. Passively getting money outside of War Phase is so much stronger than getting during War because it can be utilized so much more via trading, buying more cards, building strongholds, and you still have the option of holding on to it for War. So yeah, Rising Sun has a decent amount of replayability coming from the death of mechanics and faction abilities, but then there's a lot of replayability coming from all the hilarious interactions available from these ability cards. Speaking of, there's a really well done sense of progression and gameplay pacing. The three seasons each having different cards that get stronger as the game goes on is a key example. Sure, you're getting a lot of value with Way of the Shogun over the course of the game, but it does make your first season weaker with less money to spend on negotiation and strongholds. Way of the Moneylender is nuts because it doesn't cost anything and gains you five money, but it's the last season of the game, so it's just a fat cash injection for the final battles. Like, goddamn, all the autumn cards go hard since they're only helping you for one round. Overall, the pacing of the game is super well done. Like, sure, early fights and cards aren't worth as much, but the things established then will end up mattering a lot throughout the course of the game. Those meager one-point war province tiles matter a ton when collecting a bunch of different colors for endgame scoring. Strongholds built in the first season will benefit your recruits throughout the game, and certain cards purchased can end up shaping your entire playstyle. The decisions that you make for short-term gains versus long-term benefits will absolutely influence what you're going to be capable of doing throughout the game. And Rising Sun is the definition of the term opportunity cost because of how much weaker you get in one thing just by doing another. Kami bonuses versus map presence. Buying strongholds versus buying cards versus saving for war. Getting points from war or getting points from other methods. The list goes on and on. And finally, the game runs true to playtime of around two hours because there's always 21 action tiles in a game regardless of player count. Remember, there's seven tiles a season and only three seasons. Of course, this game still runs longer with more people because there'll be more negotiations and fights, plus you can expect this to go on longer if everyone's constantly making deals, but that's par for the course. Cons! Components. Hey, time to complain about a game's rulebook again. So Rising Sun's rulebook is alright, wouldn't call it good or bad, but we're gonna point out the bad stuff regardless because this is fundamentally a game that's easy to learn how to play but hard to master, which basically means that's more a compliment to Rising Sun's design being easy to pick up and not really the rulebook teaching you well. First off, the rulebook has really good organization of information, but then they somehow fucked it up by having an incoherent flow of info right off the bat. Like giving a general overview and basic concepts first thing is definitely a good idea, but then they throw in a ton of jargon that you're not going to understand while reading this for the first time until you make it into the meat of the rulebook where the actions are explained. For what's supposed to be basic concepts from the game board, there sure is a ton of terminology mentioned that isn't explained, so it's all going to be meaningless and hard to remember. Like, what the fuck are war and political phases when I don't know the phases of the game yet? What is honor? And why does it matter if a clan has more honor? And what the hell is a Shinto going to worship Kami? No cap, you could cut out like half of the text in here and just leave the name plus what page to turn to because I am not going to remember that rewards from harvest can be coins, victory points, and or Ronin until harvesting is explained. At the moment, I'm just going to remember that areas have rewards that I'm going to get somehow. The good examples here are things like shipping routes, borders, and victory points track for avoiding unexplained game terminology. This problem continues into a lot of the basic concepts section in the next few pages, again, mentioning phases or terminology you know nothing about. And again, some of these avoiding that issue and being fine. Though in the case of home province, even though there's name dropping, at least some of what's mentioned is right there on the same page. But then the figure descriptions for Shinto and Daimyo are totally going to fly over your head because you don't know what worship Akami is or what betray and hostage are yet. Plus, in the recruit page, it explains sending Shinto to Kami. And then in the betray and hostage sections, they both mention that they don't work on Daimyo. So why doesn't the overview part talk to you like you're 
new to the game. Shinto just has to say, when recruited, page 14. You can choose to place them on Kami tiles, page 19. No special ability while on the map. Daimyo just has to say, immune to all enemy effects. And you might be going like, God damn it, Shelfside, why are you being so pedantic? Like, who cares about the rulebook's flow of information? All the rules are in there, and once you learn the game, this doesn't even matter anymore. To which we say, no, this matters. We hate having to sheepishly make excuses for how hard board gaming is to get into, and hearing people go like, haha, yeah, I have a tough time reading rulebooks. I just watch how to plays online. You know how many people are out there that struggle with rulebooks and think that they really suck at reading them because they'll read through the first few pages, get really lost, and then just give up? Well, we're going to blame that on a lot of rulebooks being hard to read front to back. I'm personally going to blame a little of that on people having dog shit reading comprehension, but mostly on bad information flow in rulebooks. And even though some parts of this basic concept section are needlessly wordy while explaining nothing, there's plenty of other rulebook parts that don't explain enough. When you return hostages during seasonal upkeep, it doesn't say where to return them. Like, do they go back to the map or into your reserves? Thankfully, a quick Google search clears that up. It's the owner's reserve. For the card benevolence, what counts as spending any money? Trading? Bidding on war? Marshal a stronghold? Buying cards? Turns out it's just buying cards or strongholds, because thank God there's an official FAQ that can be found on Cool Mini or Not's website. But again, a lot of this wouldn't be necessary if the rulebook had a glossary or just defined terms better in the first place. And by the way, the FAQ still doesn't define these terms. It just clarifies a tidbit about them. So when it comes to a card like Path of the Kennen that says, after you summon, it does a thing. You still gotta dig through the whole rulebook going like, okay, recruit counts as a summon. Betray counts as replacing, which doesn't count as a kill. This Kami that spawns dudes is a summon. Buying a monster and putting it down is a summon. Basically, stuff putting dudes down that's innate to the game usually counts as summon, but then all the card upgrades are the things that say place so as to not trigger more summon cards. Anyways, yeah, rulebook is mad, but it does look great, and there are tons of pictures with good examples once phases, actions, and war are explained, so it does explain the actual gameplay well. But then there's also tons of massive art that takes up like half the page and makes the rulebook a lot bigger and page turny than it needs to be, which may or may not be a good thing based on whether it helps break up the monotony of reading rules versus the annoyance it becomes when flipping around looking for a rule. Random artwork is cool and all, but half the page is a little too much. Lastly, for component cons, we got some functionality issues. If we look at the coins, there's no alternate values. These are all just worth one money each. Rising Sun really could have used another denomination like three or five because it's super common for war bids to reach hilarious numbers in the 10s and 20s if people have big money engines and or got a ton of cash injected into them for losing fights earlier in the war phase. Also, I'd love to further mind game during bidding by doing shit like, hey, let me change these ones into a five to make others think that I'm bidding at least a fat five, but then I don't actually do it. Next, seasonal ability card backs should look way more distinct from one another beyond the small corner icon because you don't ever look at the backs during gameplay. And for the last bit of component cons, these are all things that we aren't 100% sure about because we have deluxe components, but but we're making educated guesses anyways on some shortcomings for base game components. Feel free to comment down below if you own base game to help flesh out this review. So normally strongholds are these punch out tokens instead of the 3D buildings we got, but having a flat token amidst a sea of big minis doesn't seem like the greatest idea because even during our play sessions, our friends would occasionally miscount stuff on the map because they were blocked by another mini. So I can't imagine a flat token is very visible and it seems like this should be a standee or cardboard cutout. Finally, I've seen online that there's not enough of plastic bags, in addition to there not being enough space in general because there isn't an insert since most of the box is taken up by these cardboard boxes with plastic holds for all the minis. Which means that the tiny bit of space left was for all the punch boards, but once those tokens are punched out, they need to go into plastic bags which occupy a more 3D space and not just a flat sheet of cardboard. Which makes me totally understand why our friend that we borrowed Rising Sun from made these crazy 3D printed inserts because otherwise you gotta store those bags underneath the plastic when sliding them back into the cardboard boxes. Game play cons. Time to complain about faction balance. So I've lost count of the amount of times we've played Rising Sun over the years because our buddy had this real early from having backed the Kickstarter and all. I feel like it's been like at least a dozen times we've played in total because we did a handful last year before Ashen was like, I'm not doing this review. I hate the game too much. And I played like three more times prior to making this review. As for all of 2018 through 2020, I forget how many times we've played. I'm bringing that up because in all of our time playing base game, Bonsai has yet to win a single game, and Dragonflight has only won once. Koi, Lotus, and Turtle just keep on winning games. Don't really think this is a group meta issue either, because I've also lost count of the amount of people we've played this game with. So if anything, this would be a newcomer issue, and certain clans being easier slash harder to play. But enough about group dynamics, let's talk about the issues with Dragonfly clan. Being able to move wherever you want is less good than you'd think, because the map is pretty small, and you can usually get to where you need to go to contest the War Province tokens you're missing without having to move more than 
one province. If you're thinking the idea is to be opportunistic and move to more winnable fights, that's not really what happens in practice because a lot of what goes into winning fights isn't positioning, but rather raw force plus having money in Ronin. If Dragonfly's ability was designed to be an opportunistic skirmisher, it'd instead say, you always go last during recruits and marshals. That way, you always guarantee take advantage of how everyone's positioned. At the moment, there's almost no such thing as an easy, isolated fight because of how connected everyone is. Not just from how easy moving around is, but also because when someone marshals to build a stronghold, they're allowed to place it literally anywhere. Then on top of that, betray as an action exists, which you're also allowed to do basically anywhere as long as someone else is there. And for a clan like Koi, who's extremely good at fighting since they can turn money into Ronin, betray really allows them to be super opportunistic and showing up wherever and winning because they often only need one guy there to just participate in the battle and then win off their ability alone if they've been properly accumulating wealth. Where Dragonfly are actually stronger is being able to allocate their total force really well. So like death balling them all in one spot and winning that battle so they don't die. Meaning next round, you have a ton of dudes to either death ball again or do a really clean 50-50 split with a ton of dudes. However, the problem there is that it's contingent on timely marshals and recruits being used in the first place. So it's fairly easy to deny. Dragonfly also do really well with monsters that proc off moving into key areas. But again, that's also pretty doable to deny or even outright play around. Then for Bonsai, their ability is pretty nuts with how everything they buy only costs one coin. But the issue is they only have four money for seasonal income. Plus, you don't always want to be buying the expensive thing. And they start with lowest honor, meaning they will always go last in turn order. By the way, didn't mention this, but turn order is determined by starting honor. So Koi always goes first, then Lotus, Turtle, Dragonfly, Bonsai. And this order never changes throughout the game. So the issues we've found when only starting with four money is that you need to buy at the minimum two expensive things a season for this to be worthwhile. Because if you compare this to Lotus, who has seven seasonal income, if both Bonsai and Lotus buy a two and three cost, they're both down to two coins. But Lotus still had the benefit of using their ability throughout the round. Plus, Lotus was more flexible since with seven money up front, that could have been used to negotiate or saved for war phase. That means Bonsai needs three big purchases to outpace Lotus because they can both make two big buys and be left at a similar amount of coin. But if each season only has seven actions, it's usually the case that you'll have at most two things to spend big on because good luck getting both the trains played or guaranteeing that you or your ally plays one of the two marshals instead of someone else. Also, spending a bunch and falling low on money is a death sentence come war phase. So Bonsai is usually going to be really bad at fighting. So where they really shine is buying a bunch of point gathering cards, which is definitely competitive, but also so much more likely to go wrong when A, you always go last so others can easily just train and snatch a thing you wanted, and B, reminder, you only have four money at the start of a season, so good luck negotiating with such a meager amount. At least this card righteousness is always available in the core set during spring, because it's always a great buy for Bonsai if you're going to be losing fights anyways, and there's two copies, so you're probably not going to get screwed out of it for going last. But the huge problem for both of these is how turn order works, plus how they both start with low honor. Low honor by itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, because there are cards that reward you for doing so. But aside from those, losing ties all the time hurts a ton. But the real issue is how nothing changes turn order during the game, which almost guarantees a terrible first season by default unless you make some crazy deals and great alliances. Meanwhile, four and five player games with Koi always results with Koi having an extra turn over everyone else, which I've represented with these pictures. Just pretend each piece that matches the clan's color represents their turn. Plus on top of that, the extra turn is always the last turn. So they get to have the final say in positioning, which can be leveraged pretty hard, ranging from people begging them to play a marshal and offering some good coin, to Koi just shrugging and playing a betray and injecting themselves into a few spots wherever they want. However, we've never played three player before, and on paper, Bonsai and Dragonfly both seem way stronger three player because when there's less competition over everything, Bonsai can more likely pull off more buys, and Dragonfly can better guarantee getting the recruits and movement they can leverage, on top of getting to actually isolated provinces since the map is more empty. Plus, this is the only player count where everyone is guaranteed an equal amount of turns because 21 total turns ain't divisible by four and five. Oh, also, it's way easier to control where you are in honor with less people. So ultimately, it feels like there needs to be some slight number adjustments or rewarding changes. Like, we feel like Bonsai should say everything you buy costs two less coin, which is ultimately a buff because that means you're saving two coins regardless if you're buying something that costs two or three. Since in spring, the expensive cards cost only two, so you're not even getting that much of a benefit early on. Because right now, it's aggressively balanced around how there's autumn cards that cost four, even five if you have the Kickstarter crap. Dragonfly just feels like it needs to be a clan that has seven seasonal income like Lotus because they both have abilities that are decently impactful only during action phase, except Dragonfly is way more prone to being denied impactful usage of their 
vulnerability on top of having lower honor. Meanwhile, Lotus can just play whatever action they want while manipulating what's left in the stack, which is always good. Or maybe we're looking at this at the wrong angle and there just needs to be some sort of starting turn or honor randomizer system so that low honor clans don't always get screwed purely from going last right off the bat. In fact, Rising Sun's extreme emphasis on playing the Alliance and Diplomacy game well is sort of at odds with how some huge aspects of the game are set in stone. Examples like clans all having a set starting honor and turn order, how there's always the same seven core seasonal ability cards every game, and how the sets of 15 cards aren't even actually 15 because some of them will be relegated to the same four Onis you can expect to see super often. Yeah, I know. You'd think that all eight monsters would be available as the core cards and that the season card sets would purely be for introducing cool new abilities. The argument we're making is that while everything seems really tightly balanced around the core stuff and the 15 card sets not messing with it too much, a lot of that doesn't even matter because of how so much of the gameplay revolves around diplomacy since it's really hard to control your own actions. Meaning that players will end up self-balancing through rampant negotiation anyways. So if that's the case, why not just embrace this reality and allow for more dynamic setup like random starting honor slash turn order plus fully random season ability cards instead of core plus a set. At the moment, there's going to be some tried and true gameplay tendencies that will always be good like Koi buying Way of the Shogun since their coins are Ronins or someone rushing Koi Mainu if their Ryujin Kami is in the game. So they have four Shinto instead of three, meaning they can guarantee secure Ryujin, which is arguably the strongest Kami since buying a card is similar efficacy to an entire action while everything else is around the output of half an action. And also someone getting Yurei because having a powerful and invincible Daimyo monster is already really good, but it also synergizes really well with any of the other core season cards that buff Daimyos like, I don't know, Path of the Dragon, which adds a lot of pressure for someone at the table needing to deny this combo. Essentially, there's going to be a lot of instances where gameplay comes down to doing the politics right, or else that player will pull off their combo and fly ahead as a result. That, and also trying to convince everyone else that you aren't the threat so you can get your busted ability going, which is actually great gameplay. But you'd get the same result if more setup was randomized, which adds way more variability and replayability as a result. And even if there's an absolutely ridiculously unbalanced set of cards, the diplomacy is so heavy here that the players would be capable of self-balancing anyways. In fact, here's a really strong example we want to point to as for why this randomization would work out. Expansion shenanigans. Like we initially thought that the base ability cards plus set of cards dynamic was super thoughtful because it makes you think, wow, it's really cool that certain sets are balanced around the inclusion slash exclusion of specific cards, like Form of the Demon that rewards having Onis and the set it's included in has all of the base game Onis. What a cool setup. Okay, seems reasonable having four different Onis. Better not let someone get too many of them because even getting nine points is nuts. But with the Daimyo box, you throw in one to two extra monsters for every season. Oops, here's another Oni. Yeah, none of those monsters are attached to specific sets of cards. They can literally just show up wherever. And remember when we brought up that Bonsai can't make super good use of their ability in the first season since nothing costs three? Yeah, you can totally introduce a springtime three cost monster that's super strong. Wow, what a buff to Bonsai. In fact, none of the expansions remove anything from the game. They literally all just introduce more stuff and turn it into even more of a clusterfuck where it gets harder to deny players things since there's so many more things introduced that are good. Again, to reiterate, throwing in a bunch of hilarity isn't necessarily a bad thing, more so that Rising Sun doesn't embrace it as much, which would better let it avoid conflicts of identity as well as pitfalls like Bonsai falling into this weird, slightly weaker state in base game, but getting better when more expensive stuff to buy is thrown in. Like there's even an expansion clan with lower honor than them. On top of that, throwing in the extra monsters, new factions with their own monsters, plus giving the Kami extra effects is just so much funny nonsense that it alienates people who think of Rising Sun as a more tightly controlled experience where negotiation matters, but you can also outplay people through meticulously tracking everything in careful play. Don't know why I'm talking so much about expansion stuff right now. Let's move on to scoring so we can take this all in and give you our verdict on how to approach Rising Sun with our recommender score. This is the part where we try and critically weigh our pros and cons together to give you all a score based on how well the game did what it's trying to do, plus how good even is the thing it's trying to do. The base game of Rising Sun is gonna get a... 8 out of 10. It's a great game. The core systems of Rising Sun enable some of the most unique brain crunching gameplay out there, but at the same time, it also heavily values a silver tongue and being able to socially maneuver yourself into optimal positions. This ultimately results in a super bizarre and unique blend of skills being tested because it takes a particularly keen eye in order to spot who's actually coming out on top of certain interactions, like knowing when losing a fight actually gets more points than winning, on top of knowing how to frame and present that information to everyone else at the table in such a 
way that you mislead and or leave out key details to hide your intentions while shifting the target on your back to other players. And while you could say that these aspects clash with each other, since the diplomacy can sometimes end up invalidating the big brain gameplay because of how restricted you are with turn structures and codified alliances, it's also just as often that you're able to make those big brain gameplay aspects the centerpiece of negotiation. Thus, the score is dropped to an 8 because it's slightly marred by the component jank and rulebook shenanigans cons, and then more substantially marked down from the gameplay cons involving the balance and occasional conflicting tendencies of the game's systems. Like, seriously, come on, there's a faction that gets an extra turn in four and five player games, and everyone at the table has to self-correct that through alliances. That is some wacky design. Rising Sun is a game that's definitely not balanced in a vacuum, but its alliance, action tiles, and trading systems are so well done that even if the balance were to be even more fucked up than what it is now, it's super doable for the players to effectively self-correct it during gameplay. Albeit, this requires some knowledge on all of the players' ends once they know what they're doing after a few games. In fact, if you look on BGG forums, there's plenty of varying opinions over what different clans and strategies people think are good or not. And there's even this person talking about how their group meta continued evolving as they kept playing a ludicrous amount of times. So it's totally possible that our observations are just what our own group meta is. Though, like we mentioned before, it doesn't seem quite one-to-one -one given how many people we constantly swap in and out while playing. Our current theory is that when looking at our own experiences and comparing it to BGG forums, it may not necessarily be that Bonsai and Dragonfly are straight up weaker than Koi, Lotus, and Turtle, but rather that Bonsai and Dragonfly are significantly harder to play well. To be more specific, Turtle and Lotus are fairly resistant to mistakes because of how Turtle's strongholds are a safety net since they can't die, while Lotus is just super versatile and can adapt well thanks to tons of money and never being action screwed since they can choose whatever they want. Meanwhile, Koi will absolutely get screwed over if their player messes up, but it's hard to mess up when their plan is fairly straightforward. Get a ton of money, and you will win fights. Then you look at Bonsai and Dragonfly who are super punishing if you mess up, while also not being easy to leverage their abilities. Though it does legitimately look like Bonsai is a good bit weaker if they're balanced around their interaction with other Kickstarter nonsense and expansions rather than just base game. Regardless of whether or not it's a balance issue or a skill issue, the outcome is still going to be that low tier clans will struggle with winning, especially if you go off BGG and see all the complaints about Bonsai. And if there's going to be some clans that struggle, why not rotate who's the struggler every now and then like we said in the cons with more randomized honor and ability card setup since Rising Sun's diplomacy system is so good at keeping everything more or less in line. Anyways, enough talking about the score, should you buy Rising Sun or not? Though do note that as of this review, it's out of print, but it's pretty reasonable to look around for people listing a base game copy at a good price. So here's the verdict. If you like all these things combined together, you will like Rising Sun. A one, tons of freeform negotiation, but contained under codified alliances that will only change through gameplay mechanics like Betray or Seasonal Upkeep. Two, having to think carefully about limited actions, such as accounting for how likely you'll be able to do a certain action, either from you having access to it on your turn or from someone else playing it, while simultaneously leveraging this limitation to restrict your opponents by figuring out how to play an action when it's awkward for them. Three, a really deep bidding system for combat that can resolve in so many ways because there's four categories to bid over, plus everyone who's involved will simultaneously bid instead of only two people at a time. And four, oh my god, this game looks so cool, there's a bunch of samurai monster minis killing each other and themselves, let's fucking go! That's some classic Eric M. Lang design, a fuckload of minis and figuring out how to win by losing, never gets old. And then for the things to look out for, if you want an extremely high level of replayability that manifests in the form of really good balance plus super varied game states, Base Rising Sun may not hold up unless you shell out god knows how much for expansions and the Kickstarter crap. Also watch out for your group's player count because three player is a completely different game than four or five people because of how much more control everyone has when there's less people plus less negotiation. And lastly, note that Rising Sun is not at all like the area controls where there's tons of dice rolling and random objectives for points because this game is super punishing and requires a certain amount of engagement and expertise to get the hang of. There doesn't exist a playstyle where you're messing around buying tons of monster minis and allying yourself with whoever just to smash stuff and win because if you do that, you'll have no money for wartime so all your monsters will become hostages, your allies will exploit the hell out of you and get way more out of the partnership, and you'll sit there waiting to do the actions you wanted to do, but never getting them since you have to really jam your foot in the door in order to get those limited actions that you want. We cannot stress enough how every alliance in this game is secretly just an abusive relationship except somehow everyone involved are the abusers and they're simultaneously cheating on each other with everyone else. Not knowing this will tend to make newcomer games pretty lopsided in points with bizarre circle jerky alliances, hilariously huge harvests, and crazy ability card combos that no one bothered to contest. But yeah, definitely check this one out if you're interested, because goddamn does it look super nice while encouraging playing super not nice to your friends with its crazy unique design. Time for our personal scores! My personal score for Rising Sun by Eric M. Ling is going to be a 1 out of 10. <laughs> Screw this game. Pretend this is Rising Sun. 
Screw this game! Yeah, so you've hopefully watched the recommender score by now, and you know that I think this is a really unique game that deserves to be on people's top list. But it's a 1 out of 10 for me, at least used to be. To my fellow Rising Sun haters out there, because I know you're out there, I'm a little sorry because the more I played this game, the more it slowly started to grow on me. And so now, Rising Sun is going to be a 3 out of 10. It's just bad for me, not WTF. Many years ago, I was introduced to this new Eric M. Lane game with a bunch of Kickstarter stuff, with really cool minis in Mythic Japan, with summoning monsters to defeat others in epic battles. Sounds pretty cool. But in fact, when I started playing the game, it wasn't really the area control I thought it would be. In fact, it was filled with very weird game states of gigantic monsters getting hostaged, or people sepakuing themselves for massive buzzkill combats, or constantly triggering overpowered combinations of seasoned cards. And maybe it's the monster hostage and the seppuku relevance, but the Japanese mythical feudal theme really started to wear on me, and I started despising this fictional Japanese universe. So yeah, I initially had a sour taste for Rising Sun, but I was still curious because Eric M. Lang and cool ways to get points, win by losing fights, lots of player interaction, cool combos, yada yada yada. So then I played it more, and then I really started to hate it. The more I played, the imbalance in factions really started to show, and when playing with newcomers, their handling of the bidding system was whack, or how they wouldn't count to each other for season cards. And so many dumb alliances were made that absolutely destroyed outcomes of games. I've seen so many dumb alliances that led to stupid harvests that I just wanted to scoop early. Maybe I should have played Rising Sun with those players, but then they said they enjoyed it, so screw me. Then I found out I really dislike this action mandate system, where drawing two and then just picking one that affects everyone still felt really restrictive in such a long-ish game. Of course, then I had to play it with Daniel, and I started resetting my brain. Rising Sun is not really an area control in a normal sense. It's closer to a negotiation heavy euro with plenty of unthematic mechanics that I need to think about critically all the time. Like, there is no room for me to let my guard down while playing, and I slowly started to enjoy it more. Sure, Rising Sun is not balanced, but man, there is a lot of political potential, and that got more and more unraveled with our very gamered out friend group. So yeah, the reason why this is a 3 out of 10 is because I can feel those epic point swings, I can feel those clever season card grabs, I can feel the negotiation power, and then also the combat, but uh, I'll get back to the combat in a bit. To say this game keeps you on your feet is an understatement, but this all gets overshadowed by this game's ridiculous punishment, emotionally draining theme, restrictive mandate system, and then also the combat, which is very butterfly effect feeling for me. That is, it feels like anything can happen during combat in not a good way for me. Since money is so tied together, where money flows from winner to loser in each fight, you're pretty much encouraged to analysis paralysis and think super deeply about every combat, but then anything can happen with the money flow. It is just a very uncomfortable feeling to see money flow from player to player to eventually be slotted in four different slots. Combat doesn't feel like combat, just some bidding war to chuck dudes to seppuku and or imperial poets, or to hire a bunch of ronin who never die in combat, or to sneakily hostage a monster, gosh I'm tilted by that still. Like really, this game is not as advertised as a dudes on the map feeling experience. It's more like one to three dudes for each region that may or may not kill themselves, and then you just chuck a ton of money, and that money ends up flowing through the entire player group. Smart design. <laughs> I just don't like it. I actually feel like I'm constantly fighting Rising Sun when I play. Unit count is so inferior to money count. You're giving everyone actions with your turn with the mandates. Politics doesn't click because of the steep emergent asymmetry, as well as with the combat where I have such a rough idea on who will win fights with the four different bids. But then the game is unbalanced, so then you have to self-balance with politics, and then, oh god, why did I spend so much time on this game so many hours. I'm a board game masochist, I guess. Rising Sun is technically cool, but personally massively hateable. I keep getting Dune vibes from it, both long, epic negotiation games with lots of potential for betrayal for otherwise set alliances, careful bidding in combat, and extremely punishing to play from behind. I'm not going to play either of them ever again, although Rising Sun is more appealing to me. But if I'm looking for alliances, I would go for TI4, which is honestly just a gentler game. So screw me, maybe I'm not so much into set alliances in a long meaty game or cutthroughness, but TI4 really has an awesome world, forgiveness, intuitive politics, and the right amount of randomness with its streamlined combat system. It's entirely possible that my score could be higher, like a 4 or maybe a 5 out of 10, if I was introduced to this game in the right way with only the base game, and only played with certain groups. But I have had too many horrendous games of Rising Sun that 3 out of 10 feels like the highest it would go right now. I've played with non-board gamers, I've played with the owner of this copy, I've played with Daniel, with experiences ranging from meh to get me out of here. There is so much incredible 
incredible amounts of PTSD of me getting my monsters kidnapped because I was broke. Screw me. Or maybe the bidding system got turned upside down because someone made a massive misplay with their bidding of money. Or how two newcomers made a stupid alliance that broke this game's harvest system. They say that good art is the stuff that stays with you. And Rising Sun lives rent free in my head in this PTSD corner. And I don't want to play it again. My personal score. So I got some backstory when it comes to Rising Sun because even though we got all these crazy expansion thingy-majigs to play around with for the last two years we haven't touched any of it and have only played base game for the sake of this review because we're not going to expect you all to go out and spend multiple hundreds on all the Rising Sun stuff. And so we thought it was important to give analysis on just base game since that's actually a reasonable purchase. However I do want to note that back in 2018 through 2020 we did in fact play with shit like the non-base game clans while throwing in the extra monsters for some extremely wacky gameplay. With all that established my personal score for just the base game is a 7 out of 10. A good time. I'd say this used to be an 8 but after playing base game a bunch I need more variability from it because the asymmetry ain't enough and the ability cards need more variety. Meanwhile the diplomacy combined with buying cards to create crazy asymmetric powers are my favorite aspects about this game. Uh, also the minis. So generally speaking when a game restricts the possibilities for what you're allowed to do in a turn too much it usually tanks my personal enjoyment. Rising Sun doesn't suffer from this phenomenon as much because of how crunchy all the actions are and how they interact with all the players as a whole. Because even with only four tiles to pick from it's still really fun to think through who needs certain actions, how I'm going to react, what I need, and what's left in the stack. Plus a lot of how you get what you want is from negotiation anyways, not just planning out the actions. People paying each other to play certain actions is some prime time dumbassery that I will never get tired of. I also really wish there was more innate asymmetry or ways to build upon it because that's another thing that adds way more variety in gameplay for my preferences. At the moment everyone with maybe the exception of Bonsai has an ability that basically has the efficacy of a high cost seasonal ability card. I'm talking stuff like upgrading the turtles to make them stronger, Koi being able to freely convert coins to Ronin even when it isn't war, or Dragonfly's teleportation allowing them to move even Shinto off the Kami during marshals. Instead everyone just gets wackier asymmetry and mostly unrelated effects from the seasonal ability cards which eventually makes the clans feel less special and makes the cards stand out a lot in the last season. But then on the other hand Rising Sun has by far my favorite bidding system for combat out of all the board games that have bidding battles. Seppuku as a thing is absolutely hysterical and having four bidding categories in general results in having easily the most fun I've had with bidding combat systems because of how much I'm thinking about during the fight. It still doesn't beat well done randomness for me though because rolling dice with a small range of outcomes is always my preferred method of combat for being really fast to execute, strategic to think through, and still allowing for varied results. But yeah Rising Sun's combat is a huge part of why I find Scythe and Dune's battles to be so tame by comparison because there's not nearly enough to think about in those games during bidding. So that's where I stand on Rising Sun at the moment but this score isn't truly a 7 out of 10 because the instant this review goes live I'm going to our buddy's place and demanding that we play with all the expansion bullshit because I feel free now I'm a dog off the leash in a park full of treats because my primary complaint that's most easily addressed is simply that there needs to be more variance expansion nonsense provides that in spades I've missed those three other factions the two other sets of seasonal ability cards and all of these monster minis I've been longingly staring at but never used I can easily see my personal enjoyment going back up to an 8 maybe even 9 if we play with everything everywhere all at once because if I recall correctly we only ever introduced a few extra things at a time when playing in the past because of our disastrous first ever game where we did include everything and what resulted was a monster mash fiesta back when we didn't know what we were doing. But now that all our friends are significantly more experienced I want to go back and try that out again. Unfortunately even though Rising Sun will probably be much better for me with all the extra stuff the intrinsic nature of restricting the actions and not having dice rolling is what's going to keep this game out of ever being a 10 out of 10 for me. But goddamn it hits all the right notes on everything else because the level of player interaction here is absolutely stellar and sure to encourage constant conflict. Really glad Rising Sun and all its expansions are in my friend's collection because it's not something I'm constantly wanting to play like Root but it's definitely great to bring out every once in a while for some thoughtful and thematic mini mashing. Ooh, I'm so excited to play Bonsai when we throw in more stuff so I can buy all that crazy new shit because Discount Godzilla sounds funny as fuck. Anyways, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out our website at shelfside.co if you want shortened written reviews and if you want to support us, buy our merch or back our Patreon. See ya.